Romans chapter 3. Now go to verse 9. Romans 3, 9. And then go to verse 23. Go to Romans chapter 3, verse 9. And then skip to verse 23. Oh, go to verse 19 and then 23. Verse 9. What then? Are we any better than they? What the question is, no and no wise. For we are both proof that both Gentiles and Jews, that they are all under sin. You know that there are Jewish people that believe that they're not under sin because they're Jewish? Paul said, no, 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 no. Even if you're a Jew, you have sin. Amen? All of us have come under sin. Now go to verse 19. Not that we know that things saith the Lord, it saith that to them who are under the law. Every mouth may be stopped, and listen to this, that all the world may become guilty before God. The eye, in the eyes of the Lord, the world stands guilty. Why? Because of sin. Go to verse 23, Romans 3, 23. You want to hear an inclusive term in the English language? The one word that signifies inclusiveness? All. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For those that are watching, they want to know, is sin real? Is sin permanent? Yes, it says so in the Bible. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That all is an inclusive term. That means no matter who it is, no matter their standing in society, no matter how rich or popular or famous they are, no matter how good looking or beautiful they are, we have all sinned. So what's the answer? If all of us have sinned, what is the answer? Now go to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 23. This is what we're talking about payment. You want to talk about payment? Listen to this analogy that Paul writes to the Christians in Rome. For the wages of sin, listen to this, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin you got to pay. It's death. In other words, the way that you pay for our sins, if I were to die in my sins right now, apart from Jesus Christ, apart from His forgiveness and mercy, apart from His blood, then I would spend eternal life paying for my sins. It's called death. How many of you have a credit card? Okay. All want a credit card. No, you don't. You get a credit card, you make a, you, you buy a few purchases, the interest rate shoots you, and you're paying months on a card that it should have only taken days, right? There are people that are enslaved to their credit cards. They're enslaved to the debt of them. They have to pay for it. Their, cuts are cut, their cards are cut up. Their, their credit has been discredited and corrupted. They can't buy a house. They can't buy a car. Why? Because of debt. It works like that in spirituality as well. If sins, if you die in your sins, not knowing Jesus, not asking for forgiveness of your sins, turning to God, being born again, you will pay for your sins for eternity. Why? For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is how we think. Man's thinking is this. I don't believe in sin, so therefore if I don't believe in sin, I don't have to worry about sin. Godly thinking is this. There is sin. And the only one that can take away my sins is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Again, this is how the unbeliever thinks, and this is how the believer thinks. Which way do you think? Do you believe in sin? I just read you from the Bible that sin exists, that sin is real. I just read you verse after verse after verse about that. Sin is real. Well, what if I have a choice not to believe in sin? Here's the thing about choice. You ready for this? I'm going to show you something about choice according to the scriptures that it's going to boggle your mind. Ready for this? Romans 6.23. The word choice in its original term and meaning means I see. If you look according to the Greek and Aramaic meaning of the word choice, the word choice comes from I see. Okay? That's where choice comes from. When you make a choice, you make it based on your perception. 
on what you see. When you make a choice between two or more things, let's say you go to a restaurant, right? You get a menu, okay? Some of us, like when we go to a certain restaurant, we know what we get all the time. We order the usual, right, for the most part. We know what we want. Sometimes we don't need a menu. Why? Because we already know what we want to eat. But if you're going to a restaurant for the first time, you get a menu, and you see all these choices, we see a lot of things. We can't order everything on the menu, so we have to make a choice. We have to pick one, all right? Whether it be an appetizer, whether it be a drink, or whether it be the main course, we have to make a choice. Houses, cars, jobs, you make a choice. This is what you see. But here's the thing we're gonna talk about choice here that a lot of people get hung up on. The power of choice does not rest in who you are. The power of choice rests in what God allows you. Do you understand what we're saying? In other words, this. Does God allow you to make a choice outside His will? Now, before you answer that question, do you believe God's in control, yes or no? You believe he's in control of everything. He's in control of every single thing that exists. He's in control of your past, your present, and your future. He controls time. He controls the number of hairs in our head. I'm losing mine. He controls your job. He controls your life. See, only God has that total control. He's God. But see, the denunciation of choice is this. People actually think they have the power to choose something that's outside His will. What happens when we choose something that is outside of God's will? Who gets hurt? Who suffers? We do. Then why does God allow it? Because God allows lessons to be learned the hard way as well, right? Have your parents ever told you, be careful what you wish for, be careful of what you choose? And at the time, we just simple words like, nothing's going to happen. Look, Mom, I know I got this straight. Dad, it's all cool. I know what I'm doing. I know this person. I know this job. I know this situation. Nothing's going to happen. Those are the famous last words of people that have been burned and burned and burned and burned. I know this guy. He's not going to hurt me. He's not going to cheat on me. He's not going to betray me. Do you, do you ever know someone that well? No. Do you ever know anyone perfectly? No. Who's the only one that sees all things, knows all things? Who's the only one that sees the end from the beginning and beginning to the end? Who sees everything from start to finish? Who knows everything, how it will work out before it even happens? God. Outside as well? Does that happen? No. I'm going to talk about choice here. It's a choice God controls everything. So is it really a choice? No. It's a test. We're going to study about testing next week. Everything's a test. Yeah. Everything in life is a test. Mm -hmm. Test in how you think, how you see things, what you believe, what you don't believe. A test in how you react, a test in how you act. A test in what you will do in certain situations, a test if you have the strength to do it or not do it. It's a test. It's a test about who we are and who God is. We know Satan has filled the test. That's why he's going to hell. But here the test is life. Everyday life is the battleground of testing. When you wake up in the morning, you will be tested in some way or another. You'll be tested in your code, your conduct, and your thoughts. You'll be tested in your relationships. Every day there's a test of some kind. Whether it be right or wrong, whether it be easy or hard, you will be tested. You'll be tested if your boss asks you to work an extra hour even though you're tired. There will be tests to see if someone is off the road, broken down, if you're going to help them or not. Or you're going to be a victim. You're, we don't know. There's going to be a test of certain things in life. You might find a $10 bill. Are you going to turn it in or are you going to keep it? Everything revolves around the test. You might say that's unfair. Try telling that to God and see if that works. God doesn't care about fair or not. He cares about if you're faithful or not. 
see again. But people don't think that way. Why? Because it's the mind, how they think. Go to Romans 8, 5. Romans 8, 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do things of the spirit. Here's how you can tell if a person is spiritually minded or not. Romans 8, 5 says this, If you think fleshly, act fleshly, believe fleshly, you're after the flesh. If you believe, concentrate, focus on the things of the spirit, then you have the spirit in you. It's that simple. The carnal mind focuses on self. The carnal mind focuses on others. Okay? The carnal mind focuses on a, something called our world, our perception of our world. What is your world made of? Okay? We're going to do a little bit of psychology. I did take psychology. That's scary. Now, Christian counseling, I have to take psychology. Couldn't get around it. They say, no, you have to take that. You got to know how people think. I really don't want to know how people think. Yeah, you need to know how people think, okay? That's why I'm a debater. Because debate debate requires thought, I'm always thinking. Now, when you think about psychology, here's your world. Your world consists of three things. You ready for this? You, friends, family. Or you, family, friends. Okay? The order may uh, be different with certain people. Some people respect and admire friends more than their family. Some people admire their family and respect their family more than their friends. It just, it just it depends. But this is our world. Our world revolves around these people. We interact with these people. Oh, I forgot this one. Co-workers or acquaintances. But notice here with acquaintances. I'll put, I'll, I'll put co-workers. They're not really your friends. They're not really people you hang around with. But they're people you say work every day. Co-workers, right? People you know, people you see every day. You see your co-workers sometimes more than your family, right? Because you spend seven, eight hours with your co-workers, and when you go home, maybe you spend about three or four hours with, like with me. I spend more time with co-workers than my own family. That's it, huh? That's true. Okay. If you work a 12-hour shift in a job, half your job is on your shift, 12 hours are to someone, the other 12 hours, Probably eight of those hours you sleep, that means four hours you spend with whoever. Not much of a life, huh? Your world. Your world revolves, number one, yourself. You. Fleshly people think about me. What do I want for Christmas? What do I want for my birthday? What do I want to eat? What do I want to wear? What do I want to spend money on? Who am I going to talk to today? Who well, I'm going to message today? All about me. It revolves around me. Let me tell you about my day. Right? The God is you. Flesh. To the unbeliever, all they think about is themselves. This is my opinion, my philosophy. This is the way I think. This is the way I do things. If you don't like it, tough. Kind of attitude. This is our world. What about a Christian's world? It says the spirit. Christian's world should revolve around one person. And who do you think that is? His name is Jesus. That's it. Here's why. Jesus is our what? Savior. Jesus is our who? King. Jesus is our who? Lord. Jesus is also our what? Healer. Jesus is also what? Our deliverer. Everything that Jesus does, he does everything. He heals, he blesses, he saves, he guides. He's our king. 
everything that's in this cohort. What else do you need? Right? He does everything. He, he offers his shoulder when you need someone to cry on. He has an open ear when you need to talk to him. He has an open heart so he can give to you. Who else do you need more than Jesus? Amen? I'll never forget the, the preacher that we went to church this morning and heard. He said that there was a, a young lady that he knew. Am I right, Kathy? I thought it was his cousin. Cousin. She's married to Jesus. Her life is Jesus. She's not a nun. But her life, the only man in her life worthy of her time, worthy of her life, is Jesus. She never married. Nothing wrong with that. You think she's going to live in fear of falling out of love with Jesus? No. You think she's going to live in fear of her divorce? No. You think she's going to live in fear of being cheated on? No. She got the perfect man right off the bat. Amen. Jesus fulfills everything. He fulfills everything in our life, our health, our future, our past, our present. He does everything. See, that's what it means to be spiritually minded. Why don't you believe in abortion? Well, an abortion because it's against Jesus. End of story. End of that. That's it. You mean to tell me that you don't believe in a woman's right to choose? You don't believe? No, no. Because... I believe in Jesus, and Jesus is against that. Amen. But I, I, I don't want to listen to your opinions. I want to listen to Jesus. See, you will fall away. You're like stubble. You're here for a little while and you're gone. But Jesus is forever. He's eternal. He's perfect. You know what's so sad, Mr. Ed, in our society today? In this presidential election season? If Jesus was on the ballot to vote for him, Jesus would come in last place. Do you believe that? I do. People don't want to vote for Jesus. They don't want have they don't want a king and lord and savior over them. Oh, I don't want that man to be in in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel did not want a Messiah. They wanted a king that of their own choosing, so they chose who? King Saul. What happened to King Saul? Eventually he committed suicide. He disobeyed God. He went against God's will and order. That's when King David came into the picture. They wanted their own king. They got their own king and it failed. Folks, we want to get the person that we want. We will fail. We need a person that we need. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus. We need him now. We need him in our lives. Now go to Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Romans 8, 7. How you think. The death words of an unbeliever is this. My opinion, my beliefs. Did you know that your opinions and your beliefs, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, they're enemies against God? Really. God looks at that as words of war. Look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither it can be. Why? So they that are those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Hmm. Interesting. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you think in the flesh, if you believe in the flesh, if you act according to the flesh, there's no way you can please God. And you see, in the world that we live in today, who do you think gets the most pleasure in this life? Who's number one on the list? Who's the one that seeks self-satisfaction? Who's the one that seeks peace? Who's the one that seeks stability? Who's the one that comes first? Look who's number one in the world that we live in today, our own little world. It's us, right? I need to make the decision for my betterment. I've heard that so many times in sick. I gotta do this for me. You think Jesus ever said that about him? You think Jesus said to all his disciples, you know, go, I, I gotta think of myself. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to go through this pain. I didn't do anything wrong. You think Jesus said that? 
He says, you know what? It's your fault. You made your bed. You're lying in it. I'm going to think about me. I don't need you. You need me, so therefore, go away. Now, we serve a, a glorified king. We serve the real king. Jesus says, I came down to this earth to die for who? For you, for my friends. I came to give my life for my friends. I came to give every drop of blood for your sins. I came to pay a, a debt that you cannot pay. I came to take over your debt of sin. I came over to take over your life, to bless you, to heal you, to love you. That's the Jesus I serve. We were listening to this missionary to Mexico. You want to talk about people that live by faith? These people have no idea where their next dollar bill is coming from, from their next money is coming from. But they're building a church. They're building homes. They're doing it. Because God is providing for them. They have the mind to think and believe that God's in control of everything. If God's in control of everything, He's in control of the money, right? He's in control of people's hearts and minds. We will get the money to build a building. Folks, we need to start believing that way too. God's in the charge of hearts and minds of people. God has control. We don't. God can change the heart. God can change the mind. God can change the life. But that's only if God is pleased to do so. Look at verse, uh, again, look at verse 8, Romans 8, 8. The flesh cannot please God. Who do you think deserves to be pleased every day? Who do you think is deserving and worthy of being pleased? God. Look who's number one here, and look who's number one here. Do we live our lives in order to be pleased or to please Him? See, the flesh thinks to please ourselves. The Christian believes to please who? God. Mm, see, now here, this is something that we don't want to hear. We do not want to hear. We do not want to hear of not pleasing ourselves. We want to hear about pleasing God. See, a lot of people in our society today, they think that if they live a good life, God will be happy with them. We put God in a position of making Him understand us. No, that's not how it works. We have to understand God. We have to obey God. We have to read His Word. We have to attend His church. It's His blood that washes away our sin. It's His cross that we bear. You see, we, we don't put in a God in a position to make Him understand about us. No, no. God says you have to understand Him. See, the mistake... When we try to explain something to someone, we try to put it in our terms so they can understand things our way, right? Where I work, there's a system. I have to understand it their way to get in the system. You understand? There's a certain way of, of uh, taking inventory. There's a certain way of counting things. You have to do it according to the system. Because if you don't, who's going to get called out on it? Me, because I did not do it according to the system. You go to work. You, you have a job. You go to work in your job. If you have a uniform, do not wear your uniform. Try it one day and see what happens. What do you think they're going to call you out first off? Where's your uniform? Right? Try it! If they give you a uniform, they expect you to wear that uniform, right? Yes. If you don't go to work in your uniform and you say, I think today I'm going to dress casual. I'm going to wear jeans and a nice shirt. I'm tired of this uniform. I'm tired of these colors. They don't match my hair. They don't match my eyes. I don't like this cap. It sucks. I don't need to wear a cap. Try it. See what happens. As soon as you get to that door, the first thing, instead of, instead of good morning, how are you, how's everything, the first thing is I need to talk to you. What's, what's going on? Where is your uniform? The company's uniform, the company's model, the company's logo. Why aren't you wearing it? Isn't it something that when you work for a company, you have to wear their colors, their uniform, their motto? There's no individuality. You are part of the company. You are a number to them. Right? Look at your check stuff. 
you will see a number on your check stub. That's your number. You're not a person, you are just a number. And when you're quit or fired, they delete that number. And you're off the list. You're done. It's like you never existed. Wow. Try it. Look it up. God does not look at you as a number. Amen? God looks at His people as real, living, breathing life. God looks at you. You have emotions. You have thoughts. You are a real being. God does not look at you as a number. God does not look at you as just one in a million working for a company. He looks at you as His own unique creation. You are unique in the eyes of God. God created you differently. God created you uniquely. There is no one but you. There will be another one like you. You are the original. Amen? Amen. You are our child of God. You are special. If, if you were the only one that Jesus Christ had to die for on this earth, then He would do it just for you. That's how much He loves you. You are special and unique more to God than your own family, than your own friends, folks. God loves you more. Amen? God loves you perfectly, completely, wholly. He does not criticize you. He does not backmouth you. He does not betray you. He does not stab you in the back. He does not abandon you. He does not forsake you. He does not break your heart. God loves you fully and completely. Who else can say that you can say that of? Who else can you say in your life loves me that fully and completely? Who? Stop looking for that kind of love in a human being. It does not exist. It doesn't matter who you are. Superman does not exist. Do you understand? The Tooth Fairy does not exist. Utopia does not exist. Heaven exists. Amen. Amen. Jesus is here. God is real. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. Don't put that burden on another human being. You're putting all your hopes and dreams and faith into someone that cannot carry it. That's why there's divorce. That's why there's broken relationships. You're expecting perfection out of the imperfect. You're expecting good out of someone that is not good, folks. And dreams are shattered, hopes are lost, they're bitter feelings. And you blame that person. You cannot blame that person. You have to blame yourself because you have, you're looking for something that's not there. And that's how worthy people think. No matter how many cars or houses you own, no matter how rich you are, how famous you are, there will always be something missing in your life. No one else can fill that hole except Jesus. Jesus can fill that hole. Jesus is the only one in your life that can fill that hole. I want to say something controversial. What else is new, right? It's not meant to be controversial. It's meant because people can handle the truth. Here's, what, here's something that's going to be said. If the rapture were to happen today, there would be more people on this earth than more people going home. If Jesus were to come today, more people would be left behind than going home. Is that being judgmental?